Welcome everyone to ACE, and we're excited to be here at the Warriors Actors Roundtable. My name is Nancy Wang Yun. I'm a sociologist and I love me some Asian, Asian American uh, cinema, obviously. And I'm just so excited to be here. And I wanted all the actors to introduce themselves. Um, and so please, let's start with Olivia. Thank you, Nancy. Um, and thanks so much for being here. Um, my name is Olivia Chang, and I play Ah Toy on uh, Two Seasons Warrior. Oh, okay. Hey, uh, I'm Perry Young, and I, I'm Chinese American, born and raised in Oakland, California. Um, I live in New York City now, and I play Father June in Warrior. Hi, I'm Hoon Lee. I play Wang Chao in Warrior. Okay, great. Uh, so I wanted to actually start off a question that I love hearing at roundtables and panels is, when did you first see yourself on screen that reflected your lived experience? So for me, it was uh, Joy Luck Club. Uh, I think I, I actually was born in Taiwan. And so I saw like Asian faces, Chinese faces. Um, but when I immigrated here at age five, it wasn't until Joy Luck Club that I actually saw an Asian American experience. and and. Uh, uh, roles that I actually related to personally. So, so how about you guys? Um, should we start with Perry? Well, I mean, I, you know, I watched a lot of TV growing up. I was a, I was like, you know, a, a, the youngest child of an immigrant family. So they babysat me with television. And this was like the late sixties when I was watching a lot of TV. And I thought, you know, like all these white characters, I, I wanted to be like Tony Curtis. Rock Hudson, you know, and I didn't see anyone liking me. I didn't know any different until we went to Chinatown one day and saw, I think it was Fist of Fury. And there on the screen was Bruce Lee. And it was so crystal clear that I had never seen an Asian male like that, who was cool. I mean, this was the 1970s, right? Or late sixties. And anything else we saw in Chinatown, Chinese movie theaters were kind of classical Chinese Kung Fu films. But then we have this 1970s cool dude like Bruce Lee. And I went, that's the guy. That's like me. I mean, that's who I wanted to be. So it's so amazing that I'm actually in Warrior, you know, because it was like, I've made the circle, you know, from the moment I remembered like a representation, true representation on the cellular screen. So it's an amazing. And, that was the moment. So cool. So how about Hun? Um, gosh, you know, it, it's an interesting question and it's a good question. I don't think that I've actually ever really given it that much thought um, in terms of some sort of a, a moment uh, where a switch went off. But I, I'd actually say that I don't know that I, I have felt that yet. I don't know that I felt some role where I was sort of unaware of the ethnic component, the audience was unaware of the ethnic component, the writers were unaware of the ethnic component. Because I think for the vast majority of uh, people who grew up that, as I did, as a, an Asian American in the suburbs born here, um, race isn't something I, I think about 24-7. I just sort of felt myself sort of blended into the community. And so you I guess I'm fortunate in the way that I, I've been shocked when I've been sort of forced to confront it at times in a negative way, um, when other people have sort of held it against me. Um, but I don't know that I've seen a role where I, I really thought that it really could have been anybody and they chose anybody and then it wasn't part of the calculus. Um, so maybe further to go. Olivia? My moment um, was Sandra O. Uh, I'm Asian Canadian, and I remember seeing her on the cover of, I don't know if it was a TV guide, but it was some sort of publication like that. And she was being featured because she was about to star in a CBC, a Canadian Broadcasting Corporation miniseries based on a book written by a Canadian um, Vancouver-based author, Evelyn Lau. And the project was called The Diaries of Evelyn Lau. And I remember getting this weekly, you know, uh, publication and going like, who's this? And I remember like reading the article. I still remember details of the article. And I remember kind of counting the days until I could see Sandra O oh on this project that really in a way reflected what I understood of being Asian Canadian. 
um, and not just Asian Canadian, but an Asian Canadian artist. Um, and I still remember scenes from that mini series. And I still remember um, how moved I was by Sandra O's performance. Um, I think for me, that was my first kind of lightning bulb moment. So how would you guys say that things have changed in terms of the roles that you've been able to get in the last few years? I think maybe, I think everyone thinks that Crazy Rich Asians was kind of the, the moment, but perhaps not. So let's hear from you know your lived experience as working actors. So um, Olivia, do you wanna go again? <laughs> Sure. Um, hmm. I I think what's changed for me in the last five, six years um, is, is actually even being able to audition for lead roles. And, and what I'm defining as lead roles right now is, you know, in a show like Warrior, for instance, um, I have the opportunity to have an arc. I have an opportunity to uh, be in the foreground of stories that center my voice and center the voices of uh, other Asian artists who, who look like me or, 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 or have some kind of um, resonance with my cultural background. Um, so that has been something really different because most of my career, I've been what I call a Canadian service actor where, you know, we, we are cast on American productions that come to Vancouver and we're very much the day players. Or, you know, if we're lucky, we're kind of the guest stars that do the heavy lifting in a procedural because we're crying because something terrible has happened to us and the American leads come in and they solve the case, you know? Um, so that's how things have changed uh, for me. And, you know, at the same time, um, I'm also really aware that, you know, the, the roles, the, the two in particular, and, and especially the one, you know, the one in Warrior, I've gotten the opportunity to play women based on actual historical women. And I think because of that, sometimes I think, you know, it, it touches on, an, on a historical pain for Asian American and Asian Canadian women, because I am playing women who, you know, are known sex workers or concubines. Um, and I think I completely understand the, the, the pain that's been expressed to me by, by women watching or women who express that it's hard for them to watch. And I think maybe the difference in these two particular roles is, is that, um, um, that again, they're not just two dimensional caricatures who aren't explored as fully complex, flawed, you know, human beings with beating hearts. Yeah, uh, I, can I dig a little bit into your role? Because Absolutely. I do feel like, um, yeah, Chinese American, Asian American women have faced a lot of sexism and racism in Hollywood. And so how does your character subvert those expectations in, in Warrior? Because I noticed that it really turns a lot of these notions on its head. I mean, I guess, yeah, when you first see it, it's like, oh my gosh, she's a madam at a brothel, right? So how does your character uh, subvert those um, stereotypes? I hope my character subverts those stereotypes because one, there's a vigilante quality to her. So I have literally had men in my life say to me, well, shouldn't you be more submissive? Aren't Asian women supposed to be more submissive and docile? And these are actual interpersonal, you know, within 10 minutes of, of meeting, if I don't stay in line, I get these comments from almost complete strangers who've known me for 10 minutes. So I feel like what the writers have given me to do through Atoy is, she is a character who has autonomy. She is a character who, is boxed into a very oppressive system, is aware of how she's seen, is aware of how white people see her in their space and allows herself to be undermined so that she can use it to her advantage. And I think the complexity and the intelligence with which they write a toy, it's already a, subvers a subversion in itself of 
the docile lotus flower that Hollywood has traditionally, you know, put someone who looks like me into that kind of a box. Yeah. I love that she is not just kind of, you know, someone with a golden heart, which we've seen before, but that, like you said, the vigilante, the, the kick ass, <laughs> you know, um, I don't know, kind of superhero, anti-racist, <laughs> you know, which is really great for, for contemporary times. It resonates with, um, with what we're thinking about these days. So, so thank you. Um, so Perry, uh, how have roles changed for you? Well, um, I started out mostly doing theater and I still do and performance art and music and, and somehow I found myself on the stage and then, you know, people suggested that I should try TV and film actually to try to make a living. So <laughs> around 19, they around lied. Nine, <laughs> they lied it's true. You. It's a, it's partly true. <laughs> one true. So I, I, around 1994, I started trying to audition for TV and you know, the roles, t you know, for Asian men back then were like waiters, you know, delivery men, Chinatown gangsters, which still exists, but you know, they're bigger in dimension. So, you know, after a couple of these auditions, I was like, wow, there's really no room for me, you know, and these roles were like one day players, you probably don't have a line. And, um, you know, it's, it's just not worth it doing that kind of thing. And what I got to do in theater was to show who uh, an Asian American person can be, you know, a, a blank palette on stage, you could sort of paint your picture for the audience there. In Hollywood and TV, it was so locked into the sort of, you know, the, the white lens of Hollywood and how we fit into their storytelling. Um, so I, I dropped out. I basically didn't do any auditions for TV and film. And then I, um, I had children. So basically I really dropped out. And, um, but uh, interestingly enough, I saw uh, A Better Luck Tomorrow. And I was like, wow, okay, things are going to happen now, you know? And um, about that time, the Lost was um, on ABC, I think it was, and a major, and there's Daniel Day Kim, who I pounded the pavement with in New York City. And I was like, Daniel is representing. Now there's, there's we have a foot in the door. And um, I, you know, the funny thing is, I, as I was watching uh, A Better Luck Tomorrow, I had um, a four-year-old and a, and a two-year-old. And I went, I think I want to get back into TV and film, but I can't do it now because my kids really kind of need me, you know? And uh, I remember, you know, these actors were great. And one particular actor who stuck out was Jason Tobin. And I went, that's a new kind of character for Asian America. He's kind of a punk. He's a smart-ass punk. He's cool. He's hip. He's funny. And he's bad. You know, so again, a funny circle is now a warrior. I play his father. I mean, it's, it's kind of amazing, you know? So, but that's when things turned, when I saw um, Better Luck Tomorrow and, um, and Lost. And then I started to see things happen. Uh, I think I started to, cable TV came about, the internet came about, we got to see streaming, um, original content, and so many more Asian faces with original content and YouTube. So I think that was a moment where things really began to open up and around 19, no, I'm sorry, 2013, I was, my kids were old enough, like nine and 10. And I said, you know, they were, they were in their own space and they had, they could sit with a book. And I thought, wow, now's a moment where I could sort of memorize lines and go to auditions. So, um, yeah. And things, really kind of just opened up and, and are still opening up. But about that time also, I saw Banshee and I saw Hoon, I saw his character, Job, and I went, who is that guy? That's a whole other, that's a whole other kind of Asian American character we've never seen before, you know? So like he doesn't fit into any stereotype or role models. And um, I was so impressed with Hoon and uh, Banshee and Jonathan Tropper. And I want, you know, I can try to be a part of this world now. So yeah, 2014. I... So that was actually pre uh, Crazy Rich Asians. So you would say maybe Crazy Rich Asians was part of a momentum that was already starting? I, I think it was starting, you know, I think, you know, like Holly, um, 
Hong Kong films were getting hot. Right? Hong Kong and Chinese films are in the independent film um, genres or uh, audience. They were well respected. I mean, uh, Wong Kar Wai and you know all these people. They were, they they were like getting such great accolades from world international critics that we couldn't deny their talent. So it was like Hollywood had to kind of bump up, I think. And we and I think we just started to see it, you know, in in original content on YouTube and small streaming channels. Um, I think Crazy Rich Asians was a huge thing. I mean, and I remember when Joy Luck Club came out. It was huge, you know. Unfortunately, it took how many years for mm -hmm. it to happen again? Yeah, like twenty-five yeah. years. <laughs> so, how about you, Hoon? Uh, how have uh, roles changed for you in the last few years? Um, you know, uh, first to speak to what Perry's talking about. You know, one of the things that I think is is uh, a tough. It's it's a little bit of a trap is to sort of think that there's going to be this flashpoint moment where suddenly everything will change. And I, I don't feel that that's the case. I feel like, um, you know, I remember hearing people saying, uh, you know, oh, well, you know, with the success of Joy Luck Club, things are really going to be different with the success of All American Girl happening. Things are going to be different with the success of Miss Saigon. Things are going to be different. And, and things do change, but they change in evolutionary ways. They change in increments. And you know, every time the wave hits the shore, we get a little bit further in, we we're able to do a little bit more, we're able to uh, be seen in a more three dimensional way. And now we're actually encountering something uh, interesting where this sort of um, the displacement of, of particularly Asian American or Asian Canadian identities is is really now happening around this idea that we're still maybe not considered a uh, uh, emblematic of a traditional Western experience. And in some cases, we're not considered Asian enough for an acceptable <laughs> medium as well, you know? And uh, that really speaks to the idea that there's still an outsider quality here in the West, right? Um, and so I'd say one thing that's been interesting is that uh, the efficiencies that are usually gained in some something like network television shows, you know? They tend to use a lot of shorthand, right? Because that's the name of that's the way their industry works. It's an, it's a bit of a it's, a it's like a factory, you know, and they're making a product that people want to see, but they're encouraged and incentivized to use shorthand and Asians fall into that category, like black people, like Hispanic people, like everything else. And so, you know, there's these stretches of time where all I'm auditioning for is doctors and gangsters, <laughs> you know, all, and all my female friends are auditioning for nurses and prostitutes. And my black friends are auditioning for drug dealers and preachers, you know, and it's this sort of weird dichotomy about that. Um, when Job came along for Banshee, thanks, Barry. <laughs> um, when Job came along for Banshee, one of the things that was so that I felt so privileged to play him was because uh, Job himself is somebody that uh, works actively against boundaries, works actively against the idea of constraint. And I was fortunate that Jonathan was very much on board with the idea of, hey, let's never reference his ethnicity. And um, and so there were several moments in the course of the shooting of that show where I explicitly asked to remove that reference um, because uh, it wasn't because I felt like it wasn't important to Job, um, but because I was kind of curious. I was kind of curious to see how other people would react to us not paying it any mind because the hero of that show never paid it any mind. You know, Lucas Hood never makes it an issue that Job is obviously of East Asian descent, you know. Um, when my theater company, uh, this group of people that I, I, I've worked with for a long time, Mr. Miyagi's Theater Company, when we did our show Sides, which we did in multiple iterations, including Off-Broadway, we made it a point not to put in our press materials in any way that we were in identified, self-identified as an Asian American theater company. Yet every article that was ever written about us put that label on us. You know, it was a bit of a social experiment. So I feel like the way that the roles have really started to change is that uh, I think, I hope that people are starting to deprioritize um, using ethnicity as the sole determiner of a character's story, their arc, their background, their history. I used to joke with friends that 
uh, I can't tell you like how many television episodes I've auditioned for that are named Chinatown, <laughs> you know, because that's the only place you're going to find Asian people, you know, um, that sort of thing. I don't think it's, I don't think there's been a flashpoint moment, but I think that, uh, as Perry was saying, there's, there's an opening that's happening and it just increases in waves. I think of warrior as like a classic, um, like a gangster meets Western kind of genre. Like, I think like what you said about, um, like even the Irishman, right? It's called the Irishman. But I don't think we saw that. We don't think of, I mean, I don't, I, I was actually, sometimes I was thinking, are they even Irish? I thought they were Italian, but anyway, <laughs> but like, we don't even think of ethnicity when we think of, right? Joe Pesci and Robert mm -hmm. De Niro. And we just think of that as a genre, like they play those gangster, you know, movies and it would be great if we could think of warrior in the same lens through the same lens i mean i certainly do um i think of um like perry your character father june as like the godfather right <laughs> uh, very much a godfather vibe because typically i think when we see like you said chinatown gang leaders they're speaking with uh you know buffoonish accents they're um, they're one dimensional. And um, do you, how do you get kind of motivated for your role? Do you, do you think of like Godfather and those kind of movies? Uh, well, yes. When I first read the script, I went, wow, that's the Chinese Godfather. I mean, this is the Asian American version of the Godfather. And when he walks into the room, that's, I'm supposed to be Marlon Brando at that moment. You know, it's just that, how do I, assimilate those ideas into who I am as a real human being that but then presented in an artful way also yeah it's I think of warrior as this you know um it's a genre uh, action kind of television show it has tropes as we were talking about earlier the women are you know uh, prostitutes the men are gangsters but the beautiful thing about warrior I think is it's like it's it's like a mirror of society and but also at the same time it's a hammer that shapes it you know i think that's Bertolt Brecht. i mean we we see these people i mean this is society but how do these people in these particular constraints of society find agency and i see eight you know the women are powerful in their roles in this trope of you know entertainment they find power and we see that father june is actually a father and when you get to season two you'll see the father and son relationship played out more. And I think, wow, we actually get to see a Chinese American father and son relationship on a major television show with a with an arc. I mean, I've never seen that before. So it's quite an opportunity for, for me and I think Warrior. So, I mean, the preparation that goes into it actually started when I was born, you know? I was like, that's my history. When Assam got off the boat, that's my great grandfather. You know, he got off the boat saying, you know, go home. And he worked at railroads, ended up in Chicago in a laundromat. I mean, that's my real story. I understood that the anti-Chinese immigration, immigration act of 1882 prevented my grandmothers from coming. So I never met either of my grandmothers because that law prevented women. Chinatowns were bachelor societies. So it's my life story. Um, and I also try to find the, the real stories in my life story that I could bring out in just simple lines that we have as characters. And I think the, the beautiful part of, of what the writers do is like they make us real people by giving us simple lines that we just kind of breathe life into. They're not like sort of these stereotypical lines that you would hear in you know, a Chinatown scene. These, there's a lot of philosophy in Bruce Lee, so they kind of play with that also. And we sort of ride the fine line between like, this is sort of one of those aphorism moments where we, you know, expouse philosophy or how do we deal with it in, a, in an entertaining way that also has deeper meaning. So I think Warrior offers me a lot of room to investigate what, what my intention is as not only as an actor, but you know, as a human being trying to like portray and give Chinese Americans like a real life, a real face. Hoon, I think your character, uh, Wang Chao, seems to, he seems to play multiple sides, um, which I feel like actually is symbolic of the entire show where there's like no good versus evil. 
um, besides the races. <laughs> um, but but the but the Chinese and American characters, you know, it's hard to tell, right? They're complex in that way. So how do you kind of imbibe your your imbue your character with um, the kind of these moral quandary, uh, quandaries of his decisions? Uh, I think that. Um like a lot of the characters in the show, you, you know, you're dealing with a very heightened reality, right? And the thing I, I personally love about that, I, I like genre in general. Um, the thing I like about that is that in kind of cranking things up, you're often able to kind of get to, you're able to sort of distill something very essential about the, the issue you're examining, right? You, you boil away all this other stuff. And um, that other stuff is great, but I, I, I like uh, I like sometimes how, polarizing things can feel or sort of how you can look at an issue very much on its face in, in a genre. So like Atoy, I think that uh, Wang Chao is a character that has had a lot of trauma in his past and in a way that has created an incredible amount of clarity for him. So uh, he knows what he's not willing to do. He knows where he's never going to return to. He knows what's he, he knows when he'll choose death over enslavement, for example. And I think that's given him a huge amount of freedom because he knows the boundaries of what, uh, what he's willing to do and where that line ends. Um, with that in mind, I think it became a very sort of simple thing in his world to pragmatically address the idea of uh, transgressing the lines that he saw put before him. And the best way to do that is through the universal languages of supply and demand and money. And I think in that way, he's an extremely American character. He's somebody that's a bit of a climber. He's somebody that came from someone else. He's somebody that feels he gives himself license to walk in the worlds that surround him. And I think that it's interesting to see how far he is able to go in this world simply by granting himself that permission. Um, and knowing that if push comes to shove, he's got a place where he says, I have nothing left to lose. And therefore, you know, there's, there's a courage that can be born of that. That's very much tested in season two, but it's that place where he and Atoy as independents in Chinatown really intersect. And I think that's part of the reason why they have this lovely connection that I was, I was so pleased they wrote that for me and Liv and, and that we were able to have these scenes where these these two sort of entrepreneurs in the new world are able to, to find a connection, you know, um, and to, in many ways, to exploit the hunger and the appetites that are placed before them by the white population. Um, I find that really interesting. It's just, it was really tremendously fun to play. So there wasn't a lot of gnashing of teeth or hurdles of it. It was, it was all pretty much um, just trying to play the truth of the, that person. Because those truths are still relevant today, right? Absolutely. We still face the exact same things. And, Absolutely. And I feel like when I see Olivia, your character, just the, the ambition she has, but the constraints and not just racism, but sexism and, and then overcoming that. Could you talk a little bit more about how you kind of navigate the, the, the I don't know, the kind of, you know, very complex world that she's trying to succeed in? Um. It was always, you know, it's funny because even when I first read A Toy, I felt the conflict. You know, I, I felt the conflict about taking on a character that, you know, I, I had a reaction to in terms of, okay, she's a madam, you know, is this a team I trust? Is this a team I trust to take her beyond a trope? Is this a team I trust to give her a real arc? Because it's not that I want to shy away from playing characters who who really do represent um, a, 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 an unfortunate and true part of Asian American history, um, but I was I was like, am I going to, in a way, move the needle forward, um, you know, for the Asian community, even though Hoon and I have had conversations about this, like we cannot carry the weight of trying to represent everybody in the Asian community, but I do have an awareness of it. Yeah. And I think that conflict is something that the writers really mind, um, purposefully or not, um, for season two, where we really start to see almost the cracks in Atoy's psychology because 
if she were not brought to America under the circumstances um, in which we learn about her origin story, I think Atoy would have been a leader of industry in another time and another place because she's that smart. So the turmoil that we start to see Atoy go through because I think there are parts of her nature that have to go dormant in order for her to survive. I think there are justifications she makes about uh, choices um, and business practices and um, you know how she treats other women, how she treats the men of Chinatown. I think all of that really comes to a head. And for me to step into that, it, I, 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 I really agree with what Hoon said. It's you just sort of play the truth and try to find the authenticity of the situation and what the character's going through right in front of you. And I think we were blessed in that we had such fantastic writers who gave us those little moments Mm -hmm. And I think for me, you know, because of the things I struggle with personally, because I am the daughter of immigrant parents, um, because I naturally or by nature or by nurture have a little bit of a disruptor quality to myself, I think stepping into the skin of Atoy wasn't hard in the sense of theory wise, I understood, especially because I know a lot about Asian American history. I think the hard part for me was the commitment, you know, and, 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 and the commitment to not judging the character and the commitment to really um, accepting the material that was before me and just doing my best to, to, to make it as real and to make her as human as I would want myself to be seen. I just want to, I want to add something quickly to that, that, that Liv just touched on too. It's, it's one thing to have a writer or a group of writers, um, listen to you as a professional, listen to you as a colleague. It's another thing to know that they take it seriously, that it's important to them that we feel good about what we're putting out there. And that was not something that was ever faked in, in, by the writers and producers of our show. I, I can't stress enough how how much the lip service of to it is actually incredibly harmful. Um, that they never came to us and said, oh, well, we understand that this is a concern, but we don't think it's a problem. Mm -hmm. You know, if we raised an issue, they would listen to it and they would take us at our word that this was something that we needed to be on guard about or we felt we were we had to say something about. Um, it doesn't mean everything is 100%. It doesn't mean that you don't have any friction about it, et cetera. But there's a fundamental difference between a group of people that are kind of nodding along and a group of people that take it seriously. So are there any projects that you guys are working on? You want to give a shout out to what are some next next things we can see you in? I'm trying to put on 10 pounds as quickly as possible, and that's going great. <laughs> <laughs> that's a tough project to it. Oh my God, you know, there's only so many donuts. Um. Uh, yeah, I, I've, I've, I've got something I hope will start up again for me soon. Um, the casting announcement hasn't come out yet, so I can't get into it too much, but I am really looking forward to it because it's, the, the, the character lives in an energetic space that I've never gotten to explore on screen. And I think it will also subvert um, the idea of what Asian women are supposed to look like. And in this particular world, it, it really, like Hoon was mentioning earlier, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Like it's a, it's, it's an interesting thing because after hearing what Hoon and Perry were saying, I guess there's almost two types of progression in, in Hollywood. There's one where, yes, we are writing something that is culturally relevant and respectful and true to a cultural experience uh, of a community. And I think there's another type of role where it doesn't matter what ethnicity you are, not because we are pretending to be colorblind and erasing um, you know, someone's experience, uh, lived experience of, of, of race out of the picture, but because, you know, they're looking for an essence and 
they're looking for the, the, the actor who best brings that essence to screen, regardless of what ethnicity they happen to be. And this role uh, falls into the latter, and I haven't had one like that in years. Definitely looking forward to that. How about you, Perry? Well, I'm I'm having a lot of fun auditioning, actually. You know, like in the in this sort of special moment in our society where I'm just kind of at home and I get to, you know, I'm lucky that I have like another career as a musician. And, but um, when these roles come in, and it kind of touches on what we we're talking about earlier about how things are changing, it's like I had, you know, I'm lucky to have audition calls, and then I have. Uh, one that came in last week that wasn't for an Asian American at all. And it was for like, it says, you know, Latinx, Af uh, Black, Asian, et cetera, you know? So I asked my manager, just like, how, how committed are they to actually look at the other? You know, they think it's a person of color. The, t the name is, is a Western name, but like, are they serious in considering me for that part? And she said, you know, they are, and people are opening up, you know, and this wasn't the first audition I've had that was not specifically Asian. And I'm, I'm uh, optimistic in, in like, we have a foot in the door now. So we actually can't complain. We really don't know if these pr producers are open to seeing an Asian person in this role, but the door is open. So I think Asian, um, Asian actors, Asian American actors kind of have to step up too and say, I actually can get this role. How can I do it? You know, it's now it's not about whether I fit their idea because they're not asking for an Asian person. The other two auditions I had this week uh, were for Asian characters, but they don't ask for an accent, you know? So that's very different. Several years ago, they would ask for kind of an accent, slight accent, heavy accent. Um, and sometimes I'd be in the room and I would joke and I would be like, what, Brooklyn accent, you know? <laughs> and, and they just, no, <laughs> you know, people, people never get auditions because it maybe it's different for men. But I remember the first two years of my career, there would be breakdowns where they would straight up be like, "Sylvia, beautiful, sexy, redhead, you know, or blonde or brunette," and even by number one, it always started with the woman's appearance, which was always beautiful and sexy. I never saw anything like cross-eyed and, you know, <laughs> needs dental work. Um, and British television was so refreshing, you know, so, <laughs> oh my God, like people have bad skin and bad teeth and like, no, not everybody looks like Barbie. Wow. Liv, they're, Liv, they're just not sending you those auditions. That's what, <laughs> okay. you don't get those breakdowns. <laughs> well, true. <laughs> now, <laughs> My point is, is, I mean, just the fact that they would say like brunette, blonde, redhead, I would automatically be like, well, what the hell am I doing going in there for it? Like, and the first two years of my career, I would walk in like so defeated, like mm. evil, the rain cloud, you know, coming in over my head, like, I'm here, you know, <laughs> King Plate, Olivia Chang, five foot six, you know, um, and, and then I, I, I watched a clip of yours. I, I think this was your clip, right? Where wasn't it something like with every hour of television that, uh, what, what was it like women or, or, or little? It little was uh, black and white boys and girls and white women with every additional, I mean, girls actually, so youth uh, with every additional hour of television watch their self-esteem would go down. Whereas white boys with every additional hour of television watch their self-esteem would go up. Yes. and. All I'm saying is, wouldn't it be amazing if in our lifetime, we saw the self-esteem of little Asian boys and girls go up with every, and, and not just our community, you know, but in this particular context of this conversation, um, to, to see the self-esteem rise of little Asian boys and little Asian girls. And I just also wanted to add that last week I was doing press for Warrior and, and you know, people were like, hey, how's diversity and inclusion? And I practiced <laughs> my response because I, I, I sort of felt like, I feel like people want that sound clip. Like, great, we're doing fantastic and some crazy rich Asians, boom, boom, boom. Like, and I kind of said, look, I'm gonna give that praise when it's earned because, you know, I'm gonna preface this 
answer with the fact that just yesterday somebody sent me a report breaking down all the top 100 films of 2019. And they broke down, first of all, how many were female directors. And then they broke down of the 1300 characters on screen, how many were had significant speaking parts and they broke them down by Asian, Latinx, Black, LGBTQ. And I kid you not, I don't think I saw a single percentage over one digit. I think the highest percentage I saw was like a seven or an eight. Hmm. So just wanted to throw that <laughs> into the mix. <laughs> So things still suck. That's how we're gonna. <laughs> there, there, look, I think I think there's a perception of progress, and I think that's important. I think you know, I I think I'm I'm a natural like optimistic person, and I and I want to have reason to be optimistic. I just also, you know, want to put forward apparently mathematical realities, you know. Uh, I no, well, it wasn't just it was it wasn't so long ago that I think it was like the statistics were there were more aliens on television than Asian people. Oh my right? God. <laughs> and and, uh, you know, and even in those sci fi shows, it's like, well, we'll have a we're going to put someone completely in prosthetics. You won't even be able to see their face, but they won't necessarily cast a person of color. Um, and uh, I think what Liv is talking about is. You know, it's, I think that these things can coexist, right? There can be progress made and it shouldn't be an invitation to let up. It shouldn't be an invitation to not pursue um, uh, more and, uh, and a greater extent of, of both reach, quality, agency. You know, for me, a lot of it is, um, I think this is a frustration of being an actor in general, but it's particularly salient to people that um, feel underrepresented a lot of the times. It's like, we have to try to make our own way. We have to, we have to avoid the temptation to wait for permission and try to find the avenues that we can to put the stories out there. Because at the end of the day, the value of seeing representation isn't about just the, like the idea of affirmative action, right? The, uh, the value of it is that we, put forth stories that hopefully reinforce to people that there's a large pool of common human experience. There's a large, uh, there are large places of overlap and connection that hopefully serve to uh, create a different kind of lens that's more inclusive, right? That to me is, the, that's the value of it. Um, and I think it's easy to get fixated on the idea of who has what job, how many percentage you know, points for this person, this person, why does it have to be equal? You know, what's, you know, isn't that against the nature of art? And, and I think those conversations are, are important to have, but they are somewhat beside the point, the larger point. Um, and so it's on, it's on us as well to find those areas where we can do that. It's on us to push when we're given an opportunity to uh, expand the range of storytelling and the depth of it. Yeah, absolutely. In my research, numbers aren't enough, right? Even if we re yeah. reach the number, the pr proportional percentage of population, uh, in my research, we found that um, Asian American actors tend to have less screen time mm -hmm. or they have, they don't have relationships, they don't have friendships. You, you, they're just like, you know, I remember Law and Order SVU, this is back in the day, but um, still to this day where, you know, uh, B.D. Wong, who's one of the mm -hmm. most amazing actors, he, we didn't know anything about him. He just came in and said, okay, is this a, <laughs> is this a psychological profile or not? And then, and then he leaves, right? And it's, it's I feel like, as someone who is not in Hollywood, just watching, it's an underutilization of amazing talent, right? And I just listening to you guys and watching you guys on screen, I just think I'm so glad that you guys have complex roles. And I just hope that you will have many, many more because we all want to see you guys. And it's just, thank you so much for all the work that you've done. And this has been an amazing conversation. I learned so much and uh, just appreciate you guys. And I hope we all, you know, keep on trucking during this crazy pandemic time and doing this. But the fact that we can even do this virtual panel, I think it's actually opened up a lot more conversations that we can all um, enjoy and uh, learn from. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank Nancy. You so much. And thank everyone at home. Oh, <laughs>